Right, I think we should just get started there. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Um, this is our fourth webinar in our self-build series. Um, so uh, thanks again for, for joining. So this one's all about navigating costs and, and budgeting for your, your home. Um, the aim of this whole series is to give you the tools and information that you need before you embark on the your, your journey of, of uh, starting your self-build. Um, so today, hopefully, we'll, we'll cover some some topics that will will help you on that journey. Um, I'm Fraser. I'm the associate director here at Hep Homes, and I'm joined by Alistair Stephen, who's our managing director, and our guest speaker today is Malcolm Robertson, um, who's a QS that we uh, have worked with for a, a very long time. Um, Malcolm's a, a quantity surveyor that he specialises in residential architecture, um, particularly one-off builds all across Scotland, um, and has experience of building in very remote locations um, and Malcolm's obviously very familiar with our, our systems and what it's like to build on all types of sites from straightforward sites to, to difficult ones so thanks a lot for joining us today Malcolm. Not at all. Um, so today we're looking at costs and budgeting so uh, some of the key things that affect costs we'll be looking at will, will be the site conditions um, so the uh, all the things that you, you need to consider um, with your plot and what things might affect the, the build cost, the specification and design of the house, um, looking at cost estimates, so how we help you with budgeting and costs throughout the process, what it's like to work with a quantity surveyor, um, and also the payment schedule for the, the full duration from the design through to the, the build. Um, so the the session is recorded as usual. Um, so if you just keep your your mics and cameras off, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and it will also be uploaded to YouTube afterwards, so you can catch up as well after um, after the session. Um, so we'll get started um, on the first slide. Ali's going to take things away for us, um, and we'll leave a bit of time at the end just for a bit of Q and A, so you can add your questions into the. Um, into the Q&A or the, the chat box. <coughs> Hello everyone. Um, well, to start with, I'll just describe a wee bit about what we're trying to do with HEP Homes when it comes to the costs. I mean, we know as architects, not only through HEP Homes, but also through our sister company, Dolchus, that getting the budget right and aligning it with your brief is probably the most important thing you should do at the very beginning of any project. There's no point going down a long route if you can't actually afford to build what you want to build. So on our website, we talk about price clarity. Um, you're never going to get certainty when you're building your own home, but what we can provide is, is clarity. And one of the reasons we do that is because we've had quite a few clients have come to us in the past who have had pretty disappointing experiences, not only with other house companies who have hidden a lot of the costs, so they make out as if the house is going to be a certain amount of money, but they don't mention anything to do with the site. And also with architects, unfortunately, we are maybe the client gets carried away with the brief, both they and the architect get excited and they don't employ someone like Malcolm early enough in the journey. So they get a wee bit of cost certainty. So that's what I need to stress at the moment with Hep Homes is that we do put a lot of tools on our website in order to be able to price up the house design that you like or estimate of costs that Malcolm will go through later on. Um, but that's only part of the story. There's a lot of other potential hidden costs to do with location and to do with the site. And that's where people can get into a bit of trouble. So that's what we're going to explain today. And we're starting off with budget and location. So as I say, you've got to align your budget with your brief from the outset and be realistic about how much it costs to build nowadays. If you're going to build any house because of modern building regulations, it's going to be relatively expensive. And the reason for that is because you can't build poor quality anymore. You have to build to quite stringent building regulations, and um, not just in Scotland, but right across the UK and Ireland. You have to build to high standards. So you so when I first built my house back in the 1990s, 1997, up on the Isle of Skye, what people were building then were houses with 100 millimetres mineral wool, 100 stud walls. You know, I felt as if I was pushing the boundary because I went to 150 millimetre mineral wool. Um, but you just wouldn't get away with that anymore. The U values have got to be excellent. So you can't build cheap. So if you're going to build, you may as well build something of architectural quality because the, the, the fabric of the building is going to have to be a certain standard. So consider your budget, be realistic <laughs> about what you can afford. So as I say, you know, you can't just 
you know, if you, if you want a, a, a five bedroom house because you want your kids to visit you from Australia every two years, um, you know, if uh, you know, you've got to be realistic, what can you afford and what should you put your money into? So if you align that budget and the brief, that's a good starting point. Um, contingency, that's something Malcolm will go into in a bit more detail. What we find with a kit house is you shouldn't need as much contingency as you would require with a bespoke design, but it will come down to particular site conditions. So Malcolm will talk about that uh, later on. Um, or un unless you want to add something just now, Malcolm, about contingency. No, it, it's a very valid point. Um, the, the one aspect of building with um, kit house construction is that many of the components uh, have been assembled before on, on other um, on other builds. So the details are well known. So the contingency, uh, as Alistair has said, is something that would operate at a lower level than if you were building a one-off architectural design house where the details haven't been, uh, the, the components individually uh, will have been worked on before, but not necessarily in the way in which they're assembled. So there's a greater flexibility required and there will be things that won't be un understood. Whereas building with uh, a, a kit structure, um, these details have been worked out and have been built before. So the contingency can be less, but nonetheless, you do, do need a contingency. And I'll touch on a bit more of that uh, as we go through this um, webinar. No, that's that's great. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, remote locations, this, uh, th this is the one where people really do get into trouble. Um, they buy uh, a site halfway up a hill on an island off an island which requires a barge or even a helicopter sometimes they get to and, uh, they, ex and they expect it to be the same price as what we've got up on the website. So the, the, lo the location, especially if you're in a very remote a area like one of the small Scottish islands or the very northwest of Scotland where there just aren't contractors around and contractors have got to move across, I mean, that, that, can, that can have quite a significant impact. So, so Malcolm, say if you were to build on an island like Tyree, for example, as compared to mainland Scotland, mainland Highlands, what sort of impact could that alone have on build costs? Uh, it could be significant. It, it, it could be, um, depending upon the availability of contractors, and some of these islands don't have uh, uh, contractors available working uh, on the island permanently, so they're coming in um, from elsewhere. So you've got accommodation costs and issues associated with that. Um, which if you're trying to build in the better weather, which is what everybody wants to do, the problem that you're then fighting against is that these are tourist areas where accommodation is limited uh, for workers on site as well. So the accommodation costs can be high. And we can see builds that are 50, 60% more expensive than they would be if they were built in say rural Perthshire, for example. Um, but it is very individual. And I'll touch on that in a bit more detail as we go through this. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that's one one of the things that we've noticed is that, you know, contractors also price in risk. So if you're building on an island where the ferries are cancelled and people could get stranded, like your electrician gets stranded on an island for a week and they can't do other work, that can be very expensive for a contractor because they'll still get the bill. So they'll, they'll price in those risks. So that's one of the other factors that can, that can add to costs. And you also have to remember is that when contractors are busy and over the last few years, they've been very busy, why would they want to build on a remote island when they could build closer to home and and not have those those hassles and stress? And um, so if they're going to price, they're going to bump up the cost. But fortunately, at the moment, I think contractors are becoming less busy in some areas, so it's probably a good time to move ahead with projects because um, yeah, things have slowed down slightly. And um, ferries, yep, yeah, that's an obvious one that adds expense, just travel costs and exposed locations. I mean, one of the things that we've noticed through the engineering over the years is in Shetland, for example, if every single kit has to be, you know, stiffened up with steel at the corners. It's just the wind loading up in Shetland is just extraordinary. But you'll also have that in some exposed locations in the west coast of Scotland. And that can that can have an impact on, on the, the overall cost. You know, even making relatively small changes to design can mean, you know, extra, extra steel, steel, steel portal frame. And uh, that that can add to, add to cost as well. So, lo location is something that's very important to think about at the beginning. So, it might be your dream location, but if you don't have the budget, then you should think again. That's <laughs> that's the main point, or increase your budget. And um, so, I think we're ready to move on to the next slide, Fraser. Yeah. 
So that takes us on to site conditions that affect costs. So we've kind of covered the, the larger scale where you're building in a context. Um, and it's important to understand that, you know, we do want you to be realistic with budget and what you can afford because we don't want you to stretch yourself and find there's nothing, um, you know, left over to put in a nice kitchen and bathroom. But we will cover that uh, later on. Um, but we've got everything, our process is engineered to help you through that and guide you through um, building that budget. So we've got checkpoints throughout that process to make sure that your site, your design, all of your, you know, your specification is aligned with uh, with your budget. Um, but with, with the site itself, there's some obvious ones here. Um, things like sloping. If it's a sloping site, it's going to be more expensive to build on. Depends how sloping and it depends what the ground conditions are. Um, generally, you can um, you will have to cut out of that ground to a certain degree. So sometimes you cut and fill. Um, so you kind of find a midpoint along the slope and then you you set your, your house in that level. Sometimes you need retaining walls within that. Um, and then obviously you're, you're taking you can you either need to remove all the earth from site and, and take it elsewhere or you can dispose of it somewhere within the site and just landscape it in. Um, so there's a, a few considerations for sloping sites. Um, also with high bedrock, particularly with a sloping site, if you've got high bedrock, then you might need rock breaking um, to, to form a, a level platform for your house. Um, generally, you'll need to have a flat and level platform to build your house from, usually with a few metres, probably about three metres around the footprint of the building um, to, uh, to allow you to put up scaffolding and to take telehandlers um, round about it um, just to, to make the construction as, as straightforward as possible. Um, but if you do have high bedrock, bedrock's obviously good for foundations. It gives you a, a, stead, a stable ground to build from. Um, but it can be expensive if, if you need to break that out. And that does depend on the type of rock because sometimes you'll get really hard granite or it might be a really um, soft rock that comes away quite easily. Um, so the everything under the ground, that's where the, the biggest cost um, uncertainty is until you actually get to site and start digging trial pits. Um, and that is something that we address right at the start of the process. We'll get our consultants out to site and start um, digging around and figuring out exactly how you know what what the ground's made up of and that helps us to see if it's going to be a particularly challenging site and a particularly expensive site to develop and um, so that is the first thing that we do as part of our process and um, to address um you know uh, the, the the ground conditions um, yeah, Fraser, I, would, I would add add to that to say that you know, quite often when people have identified a site and they're looking to buy it we would we've we've touched on this in previous webinars, but it's a, that's a really good time before you've actually purchased to to make one of the conditions of your offer to look at the ground conditions because you know, we've had clients who bought what they thought was a cheap site on the east coast of Harris, halfway up a hill, and it was literally the hardest rock in the world, just about the hardest rock in the world there, that they had a digger on chipping away, a pecker chipping away for weeks, and may cost tens of thousands of pounds. Likewise, Malcolm, maybe you could add to this, say if there's a P of two or three metres, and there's nowhere for it to go. What sort of implication could that have? Sorry, say that, but again, Alistair, I must have if, if, if there was soft ground, say two or yeah, three metres of peat and nowhere you've for got, it to go. Yeah, you've got two extremes. You uh, Potentially in Scotland, you're, uh, you're generally, if it's not within farmland, um, then out with that, you're either probably in peat or you're on rock. Uh, so uh, as both Fraser and Alistair have alluded, the issue with rock is breaking it down to a stable uh, uh, level uh, on, on which to work. Um, if it's soft ground, uh, in many senses, that can be worse because the depth of peat in certain areas can be significant and you end up having to dig uh, extremely deep foundations, fill these with concrete up to a level uh, to get you uh, back up to something solid. And that depth of concrete fill around the perimeter of the building and through the cross walls that take the loads of the internal structure um, can be down as much as uh, uh, three or four meters in some cases uh, we've had um, and can be expensive or require piling. So the point that Alistair makes in relation to uh, an offer for a site, it would be very, very wise to make an offer subject to suitable ground conditions uh, so that it gives a potential out uh, from a purchase if you find that once a uh, site investigation is done that the site becomes untenable to build upon. 
Yeah, it keeps your cost low at the outset and it really minimizes your risk of buying a site that's going to be very, you know, very expensive and difficult to develop. Um, so essentially, it, it means that you could you could pull out of the purchase or you could renegotiate if it's if it is going to be that tricky. Um, and things like so that this is all we, we do recommend that we try and get this all sorted before you complete on a purchase. So drainage is also equally very important. Um, and that does help to dictate the, the buildability of a plot. So things like um, your septic tank. Septic tanks need percolation in the soil to allow the, the, off, the, the outflow from the tank to dissipate into the land. If you can't do that, then you need to use a biological treatment tank and then find a water course to discharge to. So it's just making sure that we've considered all of that before you um, embark on the, the, the full process of things like detailed design and engineering and actually completing on the purchase of the, the plot. Um, we've had, excuse me, we've had quite a lot of sites as well that um, they're, they're beautiful remote sites elevated up in a hill with incredible views, but the access to them is really tricky and you've got, uh, you, you don't have an access track in the first place and you need to form that. So they, they can be quite expensive if you're forming a long access track for, you know, hundreds of metres, that will be a considerable cost and something that we need to think about from the, from the outset. Um, and let, equally, the uh, your water and electrical connections, if you're connecting to the grids, this is something that we've spoken about recently, Malcolm, it's connecting to the grids and making sure that there's capacity um, and also where the connection points are. Um, and if you're making a connection point far away, it can be very expensive to, uh, you know, to connect it. And um, so it's good to know that um, initially. Malcolm, did you have anything to say on that point, the services? Yeah, I, in, in all of these things, um, yeah. <laughs> The issue with drainage also uh, comes back to the thing about peat and rock, because if you have to put a biological treatment tank or a septic tank in to hard ground or exceptionally soft ground, then again, you've got the same issues as you have with the foundation uh, in, in finding stable ground to put that uh, tank on. Uh, also, you may have to excavate your drainage uh, um, pipe work to a discharge point through rock. Uh, which again can be expensive. Similarly, with the access road, uh, you know, a long access road to put in is an expensive operation to do, as are the long distance for services. The only advantage that there is one payback of being in rock as opposed to peat. Uh, if you're breaking rock out on the site, well, you can't use the rock that you break out under the building uh, in, in, in hardcore makeup. You can use it in the hardcore material for an access drive. So there is a bit of a payback on that. So you do get some benefit financially of that. Well, I mean, that's in, that's one of the, again, one of the problems with, with peat, isn't it, Malcolm? If, if, you've, yeah. if you've got a lot of, of spoil from the site and there's nowhere for it to go and you've got to cart it off site, uh, and that's a distance you've got to cart it, that can be, you've got lorries going backwards and forwards, very expensive. But likewise, you've got to bring fill we in. We have had in the past yeah. uh, sites that have been particularly tight um, and there has been nowhere to spread the excavated material on site. And the cost of taking it away elsewhere to a tip, including tipping charges, uh, which there's a government levy on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these can run to tens of thousands of pounds as well. Um, so you, you have to be very, very careful in, in uh, what you do in relation to the location of the plot, the access to the plot and the ground conditions. Um, and these are the things where it's wise to take advice and give yourselves uh, a potential out if, uh, or the ability to renegotiate the price. Because much like many other things, if you find a cheap plot uh, in a great location, it will be a cheap plot for a reason. Um, it, it, because no such things really exist, in, in, in all honesty, there will be other conditions that make these cheap. The final thing that's kind of in there relates to radon as well, and radon gas uh, does exist, particularly in areas of high granite, um, and there have to be radon protection measures put in. In general, um, these are uh, fairly simple. Uh, in terms of just a more gas type membrane that goes under the building to dissipate the radon uh, with um, ventilation. In areas that are highly susceptible to radon, so Aberdeenshire, particularly where granite has a high incidence of radon, this can be uh, quite an expensive operation to do as well. So it's just another thing to take into account in the ground conditions. Are you in a radon area? Mm -hmm. 
And equally for contaminated land, if, if you're building on a brownfield site, for example, or, you know, it was used for farming activities or um, you, you know, it, there might be contamination in the ground that will generally be flagged up when you go through planning. So there might need to be some kind of treatment, scraping back of the site and, and disposing of that contaminated ground. Um, but that's all something that, you know, we would work through in the process. And equally, if you've got an existing building, quite a lot of people come to us with with sites that have buildings on them already that they, they want to demolish because they're low quality and they want to build build new. Um, you, you'll need to allow for demolition of that building and potentially asbestos removal. But again, there might be payback because you probably will have your water connection and electrical connection already there. So it's just weighing it all up. But the... <clears throat> As, we, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're there to help guide you through that process and particularly with costings. Um, so once we've got all of this information, um, we get this all very early stage. Um, so before planning even, we'll have all of our drawings um, finalised, site layouts and all the, the, the surveys of the land. That allows us to then get an, a, an updated cost for you. Um, and you'd be working with someone like Malcolm um, to consider all the, the site um, information that you have and then look at what the kind of likely costs are before you go through the, the next stages. Ali, do you want to take the lead on this one? And he's trying to turn the lights back on. Yeah, the specification and design, again, with Heb Homes, with, it, with, with the kit house, the, there's a bit more cost certainty. I mean, we've, we've specified all of this, so that means that we can give relatively accurate prices for some of these um, items above the ground. But you know, what, but what you do have to remember is there are different rates in different parts of the country. So for example, you know, a, a joiner or a plumber in London is going to be more expensive than a plumber in Newcastle. But likewise, the plumber in uh, the Northwest Highlands might end up being more expensive than the plumber in London, the way things are going. So, but at the same time, there is going to be more cost certainty here for the things that are above the ground rather than under the under the ground. I mean, the, you know, the kitchens utility we've got, we've designed uh, packs for that. <laughs> you can always go to, you know, IKEA or you can go to Juicens and get something a bit cheaper, maybe not such good quality. But um, you have to be careful if if the units don't come made up um, and they, the flat pack, if you're getting a joiner to put together a flat pack, IKEA kitchen that could end up being an extremely expensive IKEA kitchen. So you just got to be wary of that. Um, you know, flooring packs, we provide them. Um, Kyobi tiles, we provide um, lovely engineered oak flooring. The the reason that we provide these packs is is partly because we've seen what happens when um, clients who don't have a contract administrator keeping an eye on specifications when contractors maybe swap or specification for something cheaper. Um, if you've got a good contract administrator, they'll they'll pick up on that and make sure it doesn't happen. But we have seen poor quality floors getting put in, poor quality bathrooms, bodging. Um, I mean, Malcolm, maybe that's something that you want to mention, you know, the importance of having a contract administrator, which yeah, is a role that you do. I'll, I'll come to that in the, uh, the bit about the QS role. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll certainly talk about that. Um, when Windows, you know, we, we have Nordan or Viking Windows as a standard, which are factory finished uh, double glazed timber windows, which are extremely good quality. But there's always options of um, variations. I mean, most people will upgrade to alu alumin aluminium clad windows, which aren't that much more expensive. Triple glazed upgrade is a bit more expensive, mainly because with the larger windows, they become very heavy and the glass and the frame may have to be fitted separately or maybe specialist equipment to fit it. So that can be, become a bit more expensive for the installation. The MVHR, if you're building a, a house now, it's if it's going to be a rental property or a second home, you may not be eligible. But there are grants in rural Scotland of £9,000 towards your, your shore sheet pump. And also there's a seven, I think it's a £7,000 interest free loan available as well. In non-rural areas, I think the grant's seven thousand pounds. I think that's similar in England. But if you're building a home, that'll be you'll be eligible for that. But you have to apply after the house is complete, as far as I'm aware. But that does help. But the new building re regulations are pretty onerous. You cannot get away with electric panel heaters. You can't get. You can't even put in a stove from the first of April, unless you're in a rural area where you're prone to, um, which is prone to power cuts. You won't even be allowed to put a stove in, according to the new building regulations, because they want all 
sort of solid fuel um, oil based um, units to be removed from from new houses. But don't worry about hip homes because most people are building in rural areas where you'll still have a stove. But to be honest, they're really just for decoration and um, because the houses are so warm. Um, yeah, MVHR, that is done in conjunction with the Airshore Sheep Pump. I mean, the, the, these these are pricey units compared to um, what you used to be able to get away with, which is to say, if you had a small budget, you could you could go for uh, electric panel heaters, which were very cheap but very expensive to run. But you can't do that, so that's why the government grants available just now are very very helpful towards those costs, and they work very well with highly insulated modern buildings. I mean, the people who are putting them into old farmhouses. Goodness knows what their electricity bills are going to be because they'll be working overtime to try and heat the water. And um, PV panels, that's something which a lot of people ask for. They're not always necessary on our houses because they've got great U-values in the walls, but it's something which is becoming more common. And that's partly because the the energy ratings, the SAP ratings are becoming more and more stringent, more and more onerous. Um, and that seems to be happening every year. So one of the ways that our services engineer will make sure that you get the very high energy rating of a, a B plus or an A is to add uh, PV panels to the roof. Um, timber cladding, most of our clients are now using timber cladding. I mean, it's a, what we're finding now is that most planners in most parts of rural Scotland anyway and in England are quite happy for buildings to be clad in timber. Um, when I started off, everything had to be blocked and painted white, white render and slate covered roofs. So Nowadays, they're much more open to um, alternative material fin finishes. And fortunately, the, the timber cladding is, is quite a bit cheaper than the block and render. You're Malcolm, would you? What do you reckon? It is significantly cheaper um, because the structure and the foundation uh, uh, doesn't require to be as wide. There isn't as much underbuilding to be built. And the cost of building an external uh, skin in, in timber clad as opposed to block and then render and then painted uh, or even coloured render um, it is significantly uh, more expensive than, than building in timber cladding. Uh, so it is by far uh, the most common uh, now uh, uh, of these uh, house builds. Yeah, and I think the same goes for slate. I mean, when we started off, just about every house we did was was Spanish slate, and um, they do a lovely slate, which is suitable for Scottish conditions. Um, it's called a, a Cooper okay. Heavy Three. Yeah, Cooper and, Heavy Three. Yeah, and you know that's 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 a, lo a lovely slate. But I think it's, the slate has become a lot more expensive. But I, I would imagine the reason it's become much more expensive than the metal roof is labour costs. Would, would you agree with that, Malcolm? Far, far more labour intensive to do um, <laughs> than um, a, a metal roof, particularly um, uh, particularly against a corrugated um, sinusoidal uh, profiled uh, roofing is becoming much, much more common. Uh, standing seam roofing is probably marginally more expensive. It very much depends upon location. Uh, but marginally more expensive than slate. So in, in terms of cost, the corrugated metal sheeting, uh, then slate, then a standing seam roof. But there's there's little uh, between the standing seam and slate now, uh, it has to be said, and it is very much location driven. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also, I'm sure a lot of you've seen our estimate of costs on the website for each house design as well. Malcolm's going to speak a little bit about that later. Um, but they're all based on a provision for all of these um, items, apart from the PV panels. So there's an allowance for MVHR, air source heat pump, and they're all the long houses are all based on timber cladding with a corrugated metal roof, and then white houses are, are the white render with with slate. And we've got allowance in there for for the kitchen utility, bathroom packs. We've got a great supplier that we work with that we've got costs um, fixed for them. Um, and also all your tiling and flooring, all of that. Um, so all, all of those elements, you can spend a lot on your kitchen, or you can spend a little and equally for your floors, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you can you can spend more money more more money on if you want to. But all of the the specification on our estimate of costs is a really nice specification um, to get you started. So that takes us on to the estimate of costs. This is for you, Malcolm. Yeah, surely. Um, 
perhaps we could maybe just very briefly jump to the next slide and then go back to this one if that's okay and i'll just talk about working with a qs uh and and the reason for uh people in uh not just in in, in building houses but generally through any form of construction working with a qs um quantity surveyors are uh the industry experts on cost and contract um so the reason for clients working with a qs is to help to uh, ensure that that cost certainty uh, on any build is there and that all of the the items that we've talked about thus far are taken into consideration in relation to your uh, specific plot so <clears throat> one of the things uh, I would, before we go back to the previous slide, that I'd like to kind of bust a myth uh, on is you may have heard of people talking about square meter rates for various forms of construction. And they're a very misleading uh, thing and, and something to really be, uh, in all honesty, from a QS's point of view, that it's something to be ignored. And I'll explain why very briefly. If you have a, a particular house, and you build it on uh, a given site, uh, you have to know what those site conditions are. Uh, is it a, a site that is uh, in clay uh, with an easy access, with services all to hand? What is the level of specification of the finishings that are within that building? Uh, is there one bathroom, two bathrooms? Is there a simple kitchen, a more expensive or complex kitchen? Um, the drainage system within it, does it connect into a public sewer or does it have to have a treatment tank with long runoff? All of these things affect the, the square meter cost. So you could have the one, this one particular, let's call it house type A, and you could build that house on one plot. You could build the identical house on a different plot and have significantly different costs. So this, this average of a square meter rate throws people in the wrong direction. So it's something to be completely ignored in all honesty. Um, so if we now go back, Fraser, if you don't mind to the, the est how do you estimate cost then? That, that's the point behind this. Um, Heb Homes have on their website uh, an estimate of cost calculator. And what I want to kind of uh, explain is, is what the, how that calculator is derived, what it really means, and what its limitations are. So the information that's on that calculator, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is taken from projects that are currently on site or have been on site within the last six months. The rates are taken from that, from these projects all over throughout Scotland, and they are an average for a fairly simplistic build on a relatively easy site. And the purpose behind the calculator is really for you as a client, once you have made a decision that you want to proceed and build your own house, you've got a budget in mind. You want to see whether that budget is broadly realistic. You're then able to go onto the calculator and utilize that to determine whether or not this is a viable thing to take forward or not. So you can then see where you are in, ge in a general sense. Once you get beyond the point of that, and it allows Hemp Homes to give you advice on the specifics of what your client's choices are. In other words, how much budget do you want to spend on kitchens and sanitary wear and what type of tiling? All of these things that co combine to give you an overall cost for the build to give you a general sense of flavor. However, once you get beyond that, it then really is necessary at that point to engage with a quantity surveyor to look at a quantity surveyor's order of cost report, which is different from the head home's estimate of cost. Because what it does, once you engage with a quantity surveyor, is they're looking at your site and your project specifically not, excuse me, not an average over uh, 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 the um, industry. So how that's broken down is it's broken down effectively on a trade by trade basis. And there's a little a sample example there of, of how these costs are, are compiled. Uh, groundworks, concrete work, masonry, um, below 
uh, the ground and if it was a full build uh, in, in uh, block work externally, then it would be masonry above the ground. The, the work involved in the kit erection, um, the roofing, woodwork or joinery, if you will, uh, plumbing, heating, electrics, finishings, uh, taping and painter work. Um, these buildings are, are no longer plaster. Once they're plasterboard, they're, they're not skim coated with plaster. It's a dry tape system that's used to give you the final finish. Uh, your drainage and, <coughs> and incoming services, the external works, uh, which will be in completely different from one site to another, as will the drainage and incoming services. So very specifically taking into account where your site is, what its location is, how long is the driveway in, uh, is there drainage and services to hand or are these at a greater distance? You then have a, a section called prime cost sums, uh, which covers the things that are fundamentally clients' choices. So in other words, budgets for kitchens and sanitary wear and tiling and flooring and doors, things where you have uh, a, a potential, as Alistair was explaining, you could go down the route of a, a very basic IKEA kitchen. You do have to be careful with that because if it's flat pack, you will pay for somebody on site to assemble that. Um, or a, a mid-range kitchen from Howden's or Wren or somebody like that, or perhaps a more bespoke kitchen um, at, at a higher end. And it's about really setting the budgets for these things, uh, not necessarily choosing a, the, the final uh, decision on what it is, tiling, uh, all of these finishes that you would wish in there. Mechanical ventilation and heat recovery to give you your... Uh, uh, your air exchanges and make the building uh, efficient. If you did decide to have uh, PV panels, then that would be part of that budget as well. Uh, and then you have a separate section uh, for provisional sums. And provisional sums are really covering the things which are not exactly fully known. So we talked about uh, just a, a few moments ago about rock breaking. Uh, and you cannot get from a contractor a fixed price for breaking out rock on the site. They will give you uh, a, a rate for uh, a, a rate per hour for their machinery breaking out the rock. But until they're there and they dig it out, then uh, you have to make an assessment of that. That assessment is made from the information that's provided by the site investigation report. Um, but it would be a provisional item uh, and would be subject to fluctuation. Um, other things such as um, uh, final landscaping, <coughs> final external finishes, perhaps gravel or something like that, and structural warranty. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about structural warranty in a minute. These make up the, the overall cost of, of your build, and a QS would uh, compile that in the manner that you kind of see on the right there with the individual elements of each one of these trade sections broken down into further detail. In addition, at the end of that total, you would, in a normal circumstance, look to have arguably a 5% contingency on the overall cost of the build. Now, that doesn't mean that everything within the house is potentially going to vary. It's just a method of arriving at uh, a suitable budgetary figure that is there for covering any eventualities that you may uncover when you're in the ground. Because although you may have uh, and will have um, a, a site investigation report and the structural engineer will design the foundations to uh, suit that, what is found by the trial pits or bores that are taken on the site. Once you get on site, these you may find that the ground conditions are slightly different to the average that has been taken from these investigations and you need some budget in there to cover for the fact that you may need to dig the foundation a bit deeper. There may be some soft spots which have to be filled up with concrete. Uh, so you need a contingency. Uh, and we, we can't stress that uh, significantly enough. Um, you, you cannot pare this down to the, to, to the last nut and bolt. Uh, you must have something up your sleeve to, to deal with uh, the potential of that. If you don't have any problems on site, then the contingency won't be expended. Um, but uh, uh, it's something that you do need to budget for. How much contingency would you usually recommend is 
Five uh, percent is the five percent right. is is pretty much the norm. You would need to be on an exceptional site uh, to see that the contingency would need to be more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, five percent of the overall construction cost will be adequate to deal with contingency. There are certain uh, sites that will require a bit more of that. Um, if you have demolitions, for example, if you have contaminated ground, that kind of thing, then you may need to increase the contingency more. Um, but uh, on a new build, that generally will work uh, yeah. pretty successfully. Yeah, I think Malcolm, as, as we spoke about earlier, if it was a bespoke design by an architect, the contingency would be a bit higher. Yeah, I mean, you can, I, I've been on projects where, you know, the contingency can be 15, 20 percent, um, uh, you know, on, on something exceptionally high ended. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, but uh, uh, for a kit, uh, kit construction where many of the details are well known and nothing, once the choices are made on the levels of budget for kitchens and sanitary wear, et cetera. The rest of it is very much known. So we're, we're really looking in contingency at what happens in the ground. Uh, because and once you get out of the ground, then everything else is, is set. And Malcolm, can you explain what the prelims are and how they can yeah. vary? Yeah. So <laughs> the prelims are the element which covers everything that the contractor has to do to build your house uh, that is not a given piece of work. So in other words, it's his supervision, it's the scaffolding, uh, it's his planting equipment that comes onto site, the health and safety facilities that he requires to provide for his workforce. Um, they, they have to have a, a, a um, suitable um, canteen area to sit and be able to uh, hut, to be able to dry out their clothes uh, and take uh, their breaks in. That's a, a requirement. Um, the removal of waste, uh, all the rubbish and, uh, that comes from the packaging of everything that has to be skipped uh, and taken away, the transport, the insurances, uh, the cleaning, any temporary protection. So every element that has to be done uh, in conjunction with building your house, that is not a given piece of work, but is necessary to manage and, and complete your project including the kind of final clean before handover. And Malcolm, that also includes accommodation and travel. So the prelims are very hugely if you're in a remote location. <clears throat> Absolutely. So if you're uh, if you're in a situation where you were building, uh, as Alistair alluded to earlier, if you were building on an island, uh, indeed even an island off an island, uh, which does happen in Scotland, then you can have huge transport costs, uh, not only for the operatives getting to site, because you can be certain that not, even if there was a small building contractor, uh, relatively local, there'd be certain trades that would have to come in from out with. Um, but some places have no local contractor and they have significant transport costs to get their work people there, or they have to put them up in accommodation. And accommodation is particularly expensive now. Um, the days of workmen living in a caravan on site uh, ha has long gone. Um, that, that doesn't exist any longer. Um, you know, people are looking to be able to have a, a room of their own and a shower at the end of the day. They need internet access. Um, all of these things uh, are the expectation, and it's the only way you will get people working on site. So accommodation costs on a remote location site can amount to 10, 15,000. Um, transport, again, depending upon where the site is and the availability of contractors, uh, again, can be a significant cost of a, of a similar order. Um, if there is someday a contractor's more local, then obviously these costs will come down. But in addition to that, you've got the ferry costs of getting material to the site. And as Alistair said in, in the beginning, uh, we have had a project where a helicopter has had to be used uh, in the past to um, bring heavy materials in. We've had a situation where a barge has had to be hired to take the material across because uh, some of the material was not permitted on the ferry. So all of these things back to location uh, have a significant impact. And the way in which a contractor would price for these would be within the preliminaries. 
So you've got access to all of these. Um, we've got an estimate of costs on our website for each house type through the members area. I saw there was a question that came in about um, a cost or estimate of cost for an LH202D. So that is within the members area under estimate of costs. And but as Malcolm said, you know, these are very high level costs to give you a really rough understanding. And once you've got all the information for your plot, that's when you would be working with someone like Malcolm, um, a QS to uh, take into consideration all of these aspects, in including location. Yeah, so I think Fraser, it's important to say that, you know, what we recommend is that a QS like Malcolm does a revision of the estimate of cost once once that information is known, the site information is known. So they're not giving you a, a very accurate price, a very accurate estimate, but for, I think Malcolm, it depends whether you just site this or not, but if it's just a desktop survey, it'll be 800 pounds or so. It'll be a bit more Indeed. if you visit site, just to do a revision, just to give you a relatively early stage, a heads up as to what you're expecting, which I think is a very important thing to do. It, it, it absolutely is. Um, I mean, experience from, uh, you know, I've been in the industry 50 years uh, and experience dictates that um, the critical thing to do is to get the best, most accurate cost information you can at the earliest stage, um, because th that limits your exposure and risk. Um, uh, uh, and we have had people who have in the past, you know, they've purchased a site um the, the the they've got kind of heady about something that they've perhaps been up in the western highlands in the holiday they've seen a site the the they made a purchase of it and then they find out down the line that the costs are so prohibitive to build on that site that um the project uh, has never got off the ground um so uh, taking uh, taking good advice early on um is something that is very very much worthwhile and the, the commitment to the, the, the relatively speaking, um, the, the relatively small amount of money that that represents to the overall project build is well worth doing at an early stage because it will have to be done at some point anyway. Uh, and you may as well know um, as accurately as you can, as soon as you can, uh, because that allows you then to better gauge what you can afford and how to take the project forward. Yeah. Did you cover everything in this, Malcolm? Was there anything else? Yeah, you the other to... thing I was going to talk about was the contract administration side. So, so far, what we've talked about <clears throat> is we've talked about costs. And so just to very briefly summarise, we, we've talked about you setting a realistic budget, what you, what you can afford, how much money can you combine to put into this project? That's got to be your, your, your uh, uh, top line level. Underneath that, then, uh, or following on from that is then using the HEB calculator to see whether your budget as you have it uh, would broadly fit into the parameter of making something feasible. And then when you have something more specific than that, engaging with a QS to then produce uh, an order of cost report, very site specific in relation to a particular project and a particular location. Once you go beyond that and you commit to, to the project and the project goes forward, um, you go through the planning process and the building warrant process, uh, which I know uh, Fraser and Alistair have covered on, on other, other webinars or, or will do. Once you get to the point uh, of you having the permissions, the QS um, is available through all of that time, if, you, if you've engaged with one, uh, to give you advice on any changes that are happening during planning and building warrant. Once you get to the point where you have your building warrant set and the building warrant's achieved, then the QS would produce the contract documentation that would then go out to a contractor or contractors to price. And they would then compare that price or prices when they come in to the, <coughs> excuse me, to the uh, uh, estimate, uh, uh, the order of cost report and see whether there are any variations and why. Um, once a contract has been agreed between uh, the, the contractor and uh, you as the client the employer under the contract, then the QS would then take on the role as contract administrator. Uh, and that would be to be the person who sits, if you like, in simplistic terms, in the middle between uh, you as the employer and the contractor to coordinate the contract in its administration. So dealing with any instructions, dealing with any issues on site, uh, providing advice to the client and agreeing um, 
how any variations that you wish to have or anything that's come up uh, on the site. So let's say there are soft spots that have been found, how those are dealt with and what the costs of those are. In terms of the contract themselves, there are industry standard contracts. Uh, the one that we use uh, is the Scottish Minor Works contract with contractors design. Um, and uh, it, it has been around, these contracts have been around in various guises since 1963. So they're the appropriate way to do it. But they set out the rules uh, as to how the contractor is paid and how you as the employer have to interface with the contractor and that the contract administrator is there to provide instructions to the contractor and advice to you. The way in which the contracts work, we would cover a, 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 in a bit more detail perhaps again, but broadly speaking, we'll, cover, we'll come to it, I think, on your next, um, uh, your next slide in, in terms of uh, payments to the contractor. But the, contract, the, the contract administrator uh, takes the contract from once it has been set in place, from a pre-start meeting with the contractor uh, and the client if they are there, because we do get clients who live abroad and don't come to these uh, uh, meetings, they perhaps only come along at the end, um, or we get clients who come to everyone. <clears throat> and every four weeks, there is a meeting on site from the point of start, a value of the work that has been done by the contractor uh, is calculated and the contract administrator issues a certificate to the client and the contractor to which the contractor then raises an invoice and the clients then pay on that certified amount. Uh, and a little bit more of that will come to in, in a minute or two. Um, but that's how the contracts work. The other thing is uh, warranties. And there's a note in there about warranties. Um, in contractual terms, you're not obliged to take a warranty at all. It's not a legal requirement. Um, but if you take a mortgage uh, to fund your project, then you can almost guarantee that the mortgage provider will request that you have a warranty. So if, for example, you went and bought a persimmon house, you would invariably get an NHBC or equivalent warranty, a uh, 10 year structural warranty. These warranties are available <clears throat> on these builds and they cover that 10 year period after completion. But also more importantly, uh, perhaps, is nobody knows what the circumstances are going to be, you know, within that next 10 years. Uh, and so if you imagine the scenario where you decide, say you, you build a house and six years down the line, your circumstances change and you want to sell that house. And I say, come along to, uh, to make a purchase, but I'm then taking a mortgage. My mortgage provider would then look for the remaining four years of a structural warranty, and I may not be able to get the funding to make the purchase if that warranty isn't in place. So it, it's not only covering you uh, and, and the building as it stands at the moment, it covers also the potential sale because we have had deals, I've had um, properties where deals have fallen through because no warranty provision was available. Uh, so it's something else to, to consider. Um, typically, these warranties will be round about the five or six thousand pounds mark. Um, that, that's the kind of uh, average for, for one of these things um, to provide you with uh, 10 years of cover. Well, um, well <laughs> if I can, if I can, I know we're short of time, so I'll briefly describe what the partial turnkey option is. Yeah, if you would, I, mean, I was just going to, I was just going to say that that's maybe a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one, one, one quick point is uh, with with the with the QS is that sometimes people don't do go to competitive tender with the QS. They might use one of our affiliate contractors or have their own chosen contractor they want to work with. It's extremely important that you get QS to go through their their price line by line to make sure it's fair and reasonable fair and reasonable and they've also not missed out anything which is a big problem if it happens you don't want to think you've got a good deal if something's missing because it'll end up in tears um yeah partial turnkey we started doing this primarily in some of the remote islands where um there's no contractors there are tradesmen so for example in tyree it's fine for our affiliate contractors or another contractor they'll go onto the island and they'll get it out the ground they'll get it when the weather tight they'll get it completed on the outside, but they do not want to hang around with all the finishing trades. I mean, they just would not do it. And um, so that's when you would organize your own or you would find someone locally to organize uh, the finish the, to finish the house off. Likewise, if you're within the industry yourself, 
and you want to do some of the work yourself, you've got those skills and connections, you could get a partial turnkey finish off yourself that as an option. The best thing to do actually is to get a main contractor to do the whole thing if possible, if you've got the budget to do it. So um, that's what the partial turnkey option is and the cost of the partial, partial turnkey it's so dependent on the site because a lot of it is under the ground, but we, we have highlighted on the estimated cost what's included and what's not included, but it will vary from job to job. So if you want to move on to the next slide, Fraser. So just briefly to go over um, payments, because it's good to know when you need the access to money, um, because you've obviously got the design stage initially. We'll, we'll cover that in more detail in a different uh, webinar, but the design stage could take nine 12 months um to get your all the design done the planning in place and your building warrant so there's, there's quite a lot of work that goes into that but relatively that's the lowest cost stage of the whole process um and ideally you don't want to be getting um you know funding at the start of the process because you're you're essentially paying back that loan at the very start so if you're able to cover the the initial design stages um then it means that you're not paying interest on on those uh, on that on those funds so generally to get to get you to a stage where you're ready to go to site um you'll have all your design fees for your agent all the consultants the site service and expenses you're probably looking at the in the region of 20 to 25 thousand plus VAT around about that. You might have a site that has some site surveys done, um, which will reduce the cost. Um, so we just need to, if we're dealing with your planning and, and building warrant in Scotland, um, we'll need to take a view of what you've already got. And equally, if, you, if you've got uh, an agent in England, Ireland, Wales, they'll, they'll need to look at um, the information you have in the plot. Um, so around about 20 to 25,000 plus VAT for all your um, professional fees. Um, and 20% of the kit is paid up um, by the time we submit for your building warrant. So that's when we've got all the detailed drawings done. We've got engineering done. Um, so we've obviously got consultants that we use to, to help us prepare that detail design package. And then when you're ready to go to site, that's when you're getting the contracts in place. You'll be working with someone like Malcolm Robertson to pull together the contracts between yourselves and the, the contract, uh, the contractor. Um, you'll have the the contract with Hep Homes for the erection of the kit. So that, that just needs to be slotted in within the programme. Um, and the kit's paid up. Um, once you say you're happy to go ahead, you've got a date in the diary to get started on site, then we put the kit into production and we've got a payment schedule. So all of this information is available on the website. So you can see a full breakdown of our fees, um, the consultant fees and all the kind of additional um, expenses you might expect along with the payment schedule for the kit. So it's really good to get a handle of uh, what, uh, the, the breakdown of the costs. Um, and then uh, the, the build payments, I'll leave that to you, Malcolm, to, to run through briefly. Yeah, surely. So as I was saying, uh, we have a pre-start meeting with the contractor on site, go through all of the details, make sure that everybody's on the same page. And then from a start date, every four weeks, there is an inspection of the works done on site. Um, and uh, following on from that, uh, a payment certificate is issued. Uh, during the currency of the build, you hold a 5% retention on the amount of the work that the contractor has done. Uh, that accumulates uh, to the end. Uh, once the build is complete, then uh, at the penultimate snagging stage, um, an inspection is done, a snagging list is issued to the contractor, which should be fairly nominal, um, otherwise they're patently not complete. Uh, once they have done that snagging, then what is called the rectification period starts. Um, normally we would have on a new build, you would normally have a 12 month rectification period. Um, some contractors try and get that down to six months. Um, if we have a difficult situation of the only available contractor and they're insistent upon it. We have had that scenario, but uh, generally it's 12 months and you hold half of that 5% retention for that 12 months. Uh, at the end of the 12 months period, um, then the final inspection is done and a final snagging uh, list is issued. Once that work has been done successfully, then the contractor is given uh, the remaining two and a half percent and the project uh, is then complete uh, and the contract is at an end. So th that's a very quick resume of, of, of how the contracts work. Um, obviously, during the currency of the contracts, as I said, uh, things that clients want to bring into the contract, perhaps change a specification for something, these, these can be accommodated within it. 
but that's part of the contract administration role during the currency of the build. A problem, that's ar a problem that's arisen in the past is that clients have borrowed money from lenders that don't align with the contract. So Smart Group says you're paying every four weeks in the, every four weeks in arrears. And if you if you get a mortgage where the only release money where you've reached a key stage and that doesn't align with uh, being paid every four weeks, you get into you can get into this very, very serious trouble. We've had clients who get into very se serious trouble because they cannot get you the money to pay the contractor. The, yeah, so you must that, have the ability to pay the contractor on uh, the in, in the four weekly stages. So that's why the likes of the Ecology Building Society, um, we've got details of that company on our website. I think they're based in Newcastle, but they offer mortgages which are specifically set up for people who are building their own houses. So they're, they're much more flexible than what some of the big lenders will offer. So that's something to keep in mind. We've also got a, a really good partner called the Lending Channel up in uh, in Perth who can help you get if you've got any more complex funding needs bridging loans anything like that they can help you put together the funding and um, so we've got plenty of options again through the the guidance section of the website um, we should probably try and wrap up now we're a wee bit over time we've got a few questions to get through so I'll just quickly run through um, the questions before we wrap up and um, there's a question on Pete and uh, Pete control um, it's obviously so Pete is a it's a big carbon store it's obviously a, 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 a habitat for a lot of animals, so there's a lot more control now around peat. And we're actually finding on some of our projects, if there is presence of peat, that they'll need a peat um, survey. So we've got um, our surveyor um, can can prepare that, but that is controlled through planning permission. So we might get through planning and it's a, a high risk peat area and um, they might ask for a peat survey. Um, so we would identify that on the job as and when it comes up. Um, good areas to look for plots. Um, I mean, any area is good as long as you're taking into account all this, all the things that we've talked about today. Generally, if it's mainland, it's a flat site, good access, then it's going to be quite straightforward to to work with. Um, if you are if you are thinking about building a head home and you want us to have a look at a plot, then feel free to to send on some information. And we can we can have a look at it for you and give you some initial thoughts. But really, it's it's only when we get on site with our surveyors and we start digging trial pits and, and doing topographic surveys that we can get a really good handle of, you know, is it a good good plot to to build on? But we can give you a kind of provisional feedback on that. Yeah, the next question, Fraser, um, from, from GM, Graham McWilliam. You must be looking at the wrong part of the members area because there is a, there's an estimate of cost for every house type. So you yeah, should find- Yeah, if you go to the members area, area yeah, you'll- yeah, you'll find that all the an estimate of cost for all the house types in the members area. Um, so you'll find them there. Uh, is slate preferred in locations with salt, uh, salt spray in the air? So coastal locations. Um, we built with corrugated metal um, in coastal areas. Malcolm, do you have any feedback on using corrugated metal or, or standing? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like everything else. Um, you know, if you're in a... A, a, a metal roof, um, if it is not um, treated, it is not going to last. I mean, obviously, a slate roof will last, you know, arguably with minimal maintenance, will last 70, 100 years. Um, a metal roof will arguably last 35. Um, a standing seam roof will last very similar to, um, uh, to slate. So you have to, uh, you have to factor uh that in to some extent uh, into it um but uh the significant difference in cost between these tends to drive people to odds reducing the capital cost uh, uh, initially to uh you know allow for replacement of a, a metal roof 30 you know 30 40 years down the line well you do get you, you do get certain metal you will be choosing a metal roof which is specifically designed and coated, as Malcolm says, for sea yeah. spray. Uh, you, you, you know, you would have to up the specification um, if you're anywhere near near the sea or use aluminium, for example. So, do have yeah. homes point the QS or? See, I mean, we 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 can suggest some QSs, but I mean, the QS has got to be independent. Um, you you make that decision. We can we can recommend some, but um, yeah, the the, the QS, especially once they become the contract administrator is very important that they are they're an independent professional with their own PI insurance and you know they're acting independently representing you initially but then they become you know they've 
they, they, they effectively become the referee of the of the contract once the once it goes on site. To the partial turnkey question, we have covered a lot covered of that, that, but it might yeah. be maybe useful just to say exactly what's included. Generally, it's your your access, your foundations, drainage, um, so your slab to build the kit off. So the, the kit direction and then all your external finishes, so your cladding and roofing gutters. So it's, it looks like a finished house on the outside. Um, the approximate cost of your QS service report. So the the feasibility report, Malcolm, what's the fee for that just now at the time of recording? A, a, desk, a desktop one is in the order of um, uh, 800, 850 pounds. Um, sometimes depending upon the individual site, um that at some point there has to be a site inspection and it, it is an advantage um uh, to be able to get to site as early as you can um we can do some stuff uh you know as a desktop at that level um obviously uh, the site visit is then chargeable in, in addition to that but uh um if clients are happy with it then we do suggest uh, you know to do a site visit uh as early as as can be done but it's not absolutely essential at you just have to caveat the things that are unknown without seeing uh, the site on the ground yes um google earth is is good but it's not infallible that's the problem yeah it gives you a really good idea um second last question is on cdm so who so if you're not using a main contractor um who is going to fulfill the duties of the main contractor under CDM regs. Um, Malcolm, is that something you'd be able to help with um, if um, you were and, QSing and, on it? As, as far as the, the CDM falls into two parts, there's the, the there's the pre-construction plan, which is the bit that you guys do within HEB. Um, yeah. Once you go beyond that, then um, it's the principal contractor who has the responsibility for CDM. This becomes a much more difficult area if you do a self-build. Um, because uh, in in the sense that you do a partial turnkey. So if you have a scenario where uh, you have a contractor puts the building up to wind and water tight, and then you, uh, as the client, then look to finish that building off individually, uh, if you literally do the work yourself, then CDM regulations don't apply. The minute that you engage somebody else on the project at all, and that can be your cousin who's an electrician, um, then the CDRM regulations do apply and you have to comply with those. Now, if you're not engaging with a contractor to do that, uh, then you have to go through the steps of ensuring that you cover all that CDM yourself. Uh, so it's one of the disadvantages of doing a partial turnkey. Well, I'll take the I'll take the final question there. Um, yeah, the, lim- the relatively limited ret- retention of two and a half percent. There should be absolutely de minimis snags, you know, once you get prior to completion. So there should not be much to do for the contractor. Um, you know, snags or defects can become apparent. And if you're in a, a very, very um, rural area, then yeah, if, if the contractor and his men have got to travel a huge distance to get there, and it's very minimal snags that they've got to make good at the end of the retention period, you know, you'll get a lot of pushback and they might be quite happy just to walk away from the two and a half percent. So in those circumstances, rather than getting into a big fight, it may it may well be, you know, and it will be led by your CA. They'll say, look, just get in someone locally and get it finished off yourself. The retention more than covers it. So leave yourself open to that. But that's something that the CA is going to deal with. Absolutely. And it's something the, the retention sum is set at the start of the, the contract, isn't it, Malcolm? So you, you said indeed. what that is and, for and the, the kind of industry the, standard. The, the, I've had I've had people ask me in the past, you know, can we have a retention of ten percent? And you go, you can ask for it, but I can guarantee you, you won't find a contractor who will agree to it. Um, so, um, what you have to recognise in, in what you're doing here that is, in, unless you're within areas that so, and I, and I kind of quote rural Perthshire as an example because it is a good example. Um, where you have access to to cities generally, and con, you know a good number of contractors round about, then you know you've got a much better chance of of um, finding contractors uh, to do the work. But once you move to the Western Highlands uh, and Islands, um, then you may find that there is only one contractor available, 
Um, and you may indeed have to wait a year to get that contractor. Um, we've had that scenario as well. So um, if you try and make conditions overtly onerous, they'll just walk away because there is more work out there than there are people, uh, you know, more people needing work done than there are contractors to do it. That's generally the, the issue. That's great, guys. Well, thank you very much for your contributions. I think we'll wrap things up there. Um, hopefully you found that useful. There's lots of information again um, that we've covered and a lot more on the website. So you'll find a lot in, within our guidance section. Um, so hopefully you have found it useful. If you'd like to, if you are thinking about building a head home and you're, you're quite serious about proceeding and you've, you've identified a plot and you've got your realistic budget in place, then please do get in touch. We can arrange uh, a one to one call and, and we can answer any further questions and uh, perhaps get you set up as a client if you're looking to proceed. Um, so just do get in touch if you want to take the conversation a bit further. Um, but thanks again for joining. We'll be having our, our next one uh, next month towards the end of the month. Um, and we'll send out further details of that. Um, we'll be uploading the, the recording of this afterwards, um, so you can always rewind and catch up if you didn't quite catch something. So I hope you all enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you at the next one.